Are you ready for the word? Yes, sir. Leviticus 23. Tonight we're going to rehearse some information that we've all heard before, we've gone over before. But we're going to do it because we need to remind ourselves of what's written. We need to get it embedded in our hearts and our minds. We need to get it embedded in the hearts and minds of our children. So we're going to go over it again. But also, we need to uh, go over this because we've never recorded this inf information to our social media. And it needs to be there as well. <clears throat> I don't know if you've looked at it recently. Uh, but on our YouTube channel, we're up to 921 subscribers. And that may not mean a lot to you, but it means a lot to me. I remember getting excited when we had 10. I thought that was awesome that 10 people had subscribed to listen. And now there are 921 people who have not only found it and watched and listened to things, but they have subscribed to make sure that they're aware of when we post other things. And to that I say, yay, Yahweh. Yes. Uh, that's exciting to me. And so this information needs to be uh, put there. Uh, we're going to talk about first fruits. Uh, we're entering into the, the night of the 16th when first fruits began. And, and the first thing you have to talk about when you talk about first fruits is when does it start? When does it take place? Passover is clearly stated. Um, Leviticus 23.5 says in the 14th day of the first month that even is Yahweh's Passover. So that's clearly stated. Unleavened bread is clearly stated, Leviticus 23, 6. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto Yahweh. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So there it is, clearly stated. But that's not the case with first fruits. If you look in verse 9, here's what it says about first fruits. Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you... Be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof. Then you shall uh, bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So the first thing we are going to see concerning the Moedim of first fruits is that there will be a delay in their observance of it. There's not a delay in observing Passover. There will not be a, a delay in the observing, observance of unleavened bread. But because there are going to wonder in the desert for the next 40 years, they will not be able to keep first fruits. And Yahweh is aware of that. And so he says to them, when you come into the land and when you harvest your crops, then this is what you're going to do. So the next thing that we see is that they're to bring a sheaf of the first fruits of that harvest. Look down in verse 14 for just a moment. You shall... Eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your Elohim. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. So when he said first fruits, he meant first fruits. He didn't mean that you partake of the first and then bring me something. He meant you will bring me the first fruits of your harvest. Now go back to uh, verse 11. And he, the priest shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So this sheaf represents something or someone, right? And uh, he'll wave it to be accepted for you. But then this is where it tells us uh, when first fruits takes place. It will take place on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So there it is. But therein is the rub. Many say that this is a reference to the weekly Sabbath. And so therefore, first fruits would always fall on the first day of the week, which we know to be Sunday. And if first fruits always falls on the first day of the week, and you are to count from this day 50 days, then Pentecost would also fall on Sunday or the first day of the week. And so that's the reason that a lot of folks uh, teach and preach that uh, the resurrection took place on Sunday and they teach and preach that uh, Pentecost took uh, place on Sunday. It's the birth of the church is what they say. 
But I contend that this is not a reference to the weekly Sabbath, but instead it's a re reference to the Sabbath of unleavened bread. Now let me share with you again why I've come to that conclusion. Number one, I've come to that conclusion because that's the Sabbath that was just mentioned. Leviticus 23, 7. In the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. So that is the Sabbath that was just mentioned. And I think that's the Sabbath that it's referring to in verse 11. Now, I know that the word Sabbath is not used there, and I also know that those who say that this uh, Sabbath is not the Sabbath of unleavened bread, it's the weekly Sabbath, they like to point out that the word Sabbath is not used in verse 7. That the word Sabbath is not used concerning unleavened bread. However, it says plainly, you shall do no servile work therein. Well, what does that mean? You're going to take a Shabbat, right? You're going to rest. It is going to be a Sabbath. And we also have the witness of John 19, 31, which says plainly that that Sabbath day was a high day. The day that would have come at sunset would have been the 15th that John 19 is referring to. And it was considered a high, or the Greek word is mega, it would have been considered a mega Sabbath. Unleavened bread was considered by them to be a mega Sabbath. Therefore, when I read Leviticus 23.11 in context, the Sabbath to me that's being referred to is the first Sabbath of unleavened bread because it is a high Sabbath. It's a mega Sabbath. And the second reason that I'm confident that it is a reference to the Sabbath of unleavened bread is because every Moedim is a perfect, precise pattern of the work of the Messiah. Every one of them. And for something to be a pattern, it has to always work. What part of his work, of the Messiah's work, does first fruit represent? Say it out loud. Resurrection. His resurrection. So if it's going to re represent his resurrection, it has to take place on the day that he said his resurrection was going to take place on. Or better put, it has to take place on the day that he was resurrection, resurrected, and his resurrection has to take place on the day that first fruits takes place. And it has to do that every time. Well, when was he resurrected? The third day. Let's go read that. Matthew 16. <clears throat> Look at verse 21. From that time forth began Yeshua to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again. When? Third day. The third day. Notice and never forget, it never ever says after three days. It always says that he'll be raised again the third day. Look at another passage, Matthew 17, 22. And while they abode in Galilee, Yeshua said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again, and they were exceeding sorry. Matthew chapter 20, verse 19. And they shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Passage after passage all say that he would rise the third day. Now, there is one passage that seems to use the word after. But a casual examination reveals that the word after should not have been used by the translators. Let's look at it in case that question were to arise. Matthew 27, 62. Now the next day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. 
Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Well, we know that it's not after three days for many reasons. Number one, Messiah never said he would be raised after three days. So if this translation is even correct, the chief priests and Pharisees would be lying because he never said that. He said he'd rise the third day. But look at how long they wanted the tomb to be guarded. How long did they want it guarded? Until when? The third day. Not after third day. Until the third day. Because they knew if they could guard it until the third day, then they had proven their point. Because if he rose on the fourth day or the fifth day or the sixth day, they knew that that, did, that, that uh, neutralized everything he had ever said, right? So they wanted it guarded until the third day. Now the word translated after is the Greek word meta, M-E-T-A. Meta means amid or with. It does not mean after. It means uh, amid, in the midst of, or with. Matthew 1.23 says this, His name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted means Elohim with us. The with there is the word meta. Well, it, you certainly can't translate that as after, can you? Elohim after us. No. Elohim with us. Meta means with or amid. So, in the chief priests, when the chief priests and Pharisees say, we know that he has gone around saying he'll rise again amid the third day. They wanted guards for three days. We know that he has said that he will rise again with or within that third day. So they are admitting that Messiah said over and over and over again, that third day, watch it, because that's when I'm going to rise again. Now, we have the witnesses of the angels at the tomb as well. Look in Luke 24, verse 4. It came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, Here's what he said. They'll quote him correctly. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. They quoted him correctly. They heard what he said. There are 15 declarations in the scripture that he was raised from the dead on the third day. I'm not going to take the time to read them all. We just read four or five of them. But there are 15 times it says he would rise or he did rise the third day. Now, if he rose on the third day, there is only one day that could be the third day. The angels quoted verbatim what Messiah said. They said, he said, the third day he will rise again. They said, he said, he would be crucified the third day, rise again. If only we knew when he would be crucified, then we would know when he would, be, when he would rise again. We do know. Yes, we do. He was crucified on the 14th. He was killed on the 14th. The 14th is day one. The 15th is day two. The 16th is day three. It's simple math. 14, 15, 16, the third day. Therefore, if first fruits is the pattern of the resurrection, then the Sabbath mentioned in Leviticus 23 has to be the Sabbath of unleavened bread, which is the 15th. He died on the 14th. 
That's day one. The 15th is a high Sabbath. On the morrow after the Sabbath, you shall bring your first fruits, which represents, the priest is going to take it and wave it, cause it to dance in the wind, symbolizing that that which was dead and wrapped up is now alive, right? So on the 16th, day three, he rises again. Now, if the 14th fell on a Monday and first fruits did not take place until the day after the weekly Sabbath, that would mean that first fruits came seven days after Yeshua was killed. Seven days does not show a pattern of the Messiah's resurrection. If the 14th fell on a Tuesday, and you know it could, right? If the 14th fell on a Tuesday and first fruits did not take place until after the weekly Sabbath, then it would be six days from the time he was killed until first fruits. And six days does not establish a pattern for the Messiah's resurrection. The only way that first fruits is a perfect pattern revealing the resurrection is if it falls on the day after the Sabbath of unleavened bread, which means it always has to be on the 16th. This can be, this we can be certain of. The 16th is always the third day counting from 14. It's never day four or five or six or seven. It is always the third day. And when did he say he would be raised? The third day. Now, those who oppose this position say that if it is on the 16th, why didn't Yahweh just say so? To which I say, well, if... He did. <laughs> he did. There you go. That's a better answer than what I was about to give. But to those who say that, I say, if it's always on the first day of the week, why didn't he just say so? The issue isn't why didn't he just say so, as Conrad just said, because he actually did. The issue is that we need to pay close attention to two things in order to understand when first fruits is. Number one, we have to understand the Sabbath just discussed was unleavened bread on the 15th. And number two, we have to understand that the Messiah knew exactly when he was going to be raised. How did he know? Because the Moedim showed it to him. He could look at the pattern of that Moedim and know exactly when he would be raised from the dead. He did not read about first fruits and then say to his disciples, I am going to be crucified and killed on the 14th of Abib. And then I'm going to be raised anywhere between two and seven days later. That's what he'd have to say if it followed a weekly Sabbath. Yeah. Guys, it's according to what day the 14th falls on on the day that I'm crucified for me to be able to understand when I'm going to be raised. I know I'm going to be raised. It could be day two, four, three, five, six, or seven. No, 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 no. He could look at the Moedim and say with a certainty, I'll be raised the third day. Amen. Because first fruits showed that to him. Hallelujah. There are two other passages that you have to study extensively in order to know these things to be so. One of them is Matthew 12, verse 40, and the other is Luke 24, 21. Mark, mark both of those. We're going to take the time to look at them. Luke 24, 21 is not an issue until you properly interpret Matthew 12, 40. But then when you properly interpret Matthew 12, 40, Luke 24, 21 uh, then becomes an issue. So you need to look at both of them. Let's start in Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And you often hear it said that Yeshua had to be dead three days and three nights. And those who say it are using this as their proof text. And those are the ones that you hear talking about trying to 
count from Thursday to or Friday to Sunday and all that kind of stuff. Um, they use Matthew 12, 40 to say, well, he had to be dead three days and three nights. However, if that is the correct interpretation, the Messiah would have been wrong when he said he would rise the third day. And he can't be wrong. So somebody else is wrong, not him, right? So we need to look closer at the text. <clears throat> Number one, let me ask you this. Looking at verse 40. Did he say the Son of Man would be dead three days and three nights? No. no. Did he say the Son of Man would be in the tomb three days and three nights? No. He was very specific in what he said. He said the Son of Man would be where for three days and three nights? In the heart of the earth. His resurrection and his appearing are two different events. He did not appear to Mary or to the disciples or to those on the road uh, to Emmaus on the third day. He did not. Nowhere does it say he did. His resurrection took place on the third day. His appearing will take place on a different day. On a latter day. Probably the fourth day. Okay. He was resurrected on the third day and being resurrected, that is, made alive, raised from the dead. He had work to do before he could appear to anyone and before he could ascend. We have scriptures that make that plain to us, so let's look at those real quick. Ephesians 4, verse 8. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first? What is it but that he also descended first? Where? Into the lower parts of the earth. He was already in the earth. He descended into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So what did he do first? He descended into the lower parts of the earth. All right. Peter tells us what he did there. You can turn there. Or I can read it to you. First Peter three verse 18. For the Messiah also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to Yahweh, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Well, what in the world are you talking about, Peter? Verse 20, which sometime were disobedient. When once the long suffering of Yahweh waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So the spirits that he preached to are those that were, were locked up because of what they did in Genesis chapter 6. Isn't it amazing how often that shows back up? Those spirits that had come down to the daughters of men and their leaders were locked up in the heart of the earth awaiting judgment. Enoch spells this out and gives us great detail concerning it. Yeshua did not go and offer them an opportunity to repent. He went there to announce to them that their attempt had failed. What were they attempting to do? They were attempting to corrupt the DNA of mankind, creating hybrids that covered the earth. And if they could have accomplished that task, then there would not have been the ability for Yahweh to fulfill his promise that he would bring forth a Messiah out of their loins to redeem them from their sin. Messiah shows up. There were times it looked like they won. Right? 
There were times it looked like they won. One time in particular, you got down where there weren't, weren't but eight left whose DNA had not been corrupted. Messiah shows up down where these spirits have been put in prison and he preaches. He boldly proclaims to them, you failed. You didn't, you weren't able to follow through. Yahweh wins again. The Messiah has come. I have redeemed mankind. Hallelujah. They lose. Yahweh wins. Jude testified of this as well. Jude verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. He has reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So these angels, these spirits... These fallen ones are the ones that Yeshua descended into the darkest recesses of the earth to proclaim judgment against them. Yeshua, raised on the third day just as he said he would be, did not appear on that third day to Mary or any of the other women or to the disciples. Instead, on the third day when he was raised, he had work to do. And that involved preaching, or preaching judgment against these spirits. And also, may as well go ahead and take the, get, uh, to take the keys of Hades while he's there. <laughs> Took the keys of Hades and led captivity captive. <laughs> Yeshua even testified that he descended first. John 20 verse 17. Yeshua said unto her, Mary, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. He, he descended first. Remember what Paul said to, the, to those in Ephesus? He that has ascended, what is it but that he first descended? And now he has come from his descent. He appears to Mary and says, well, don't touch me yet. Later, they'll be able to, but he said, don't touch me yet, for I have to ascend. So there's a lot taking place after day three. But he's not resurrected after day three. He's resurrected on the third day. So Matthew 12, 40 does not say that he would be in the tomb three days and three nights or dead for three days and three nights. And for good reason, because he was neither. He was raised on the third day, and on the third day went into the heart of the earth. He preached, he took away keys, and then later he appeared to Mary and then to the others. That brings us to Luke 24. Luke 24, verse 17. These are the disciples on the road to Emmaus. <clears throat> Yeshua joins himself to them. And it says their eyes were closed so that they would not know him. Verse 17, he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that ye have one to another as you walk and are sad? What are y'all talking about that's got y'all so sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, Are you only a stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And Yeshua said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Yeshua of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before Yahweh and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and they have crucified him. But we trusted that it, that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, Today is the third day since these things were done. Do you see the rub? Mm -hmm. Today is the third day. I've been saying to you all night that he did not appear to them on the third day. Because he was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. That means he couldn't appear until the fourth day. But they said, today is the third day since these things were done. 
Because the way it is translated, it seems to say that he appeared to the women on the third day and that uh, the, the uh, disciples had gone and checked the tomb on the third day. But we know that this cannot be true because he was raised on the third day, went to the heart of the earth where he would be for a total of three days and three nights. So he has to appear after three days and three nights. But you still got the problem with this verse. Today is the third day since these things were done. We'll talk about that in a moment, but let's finish reading the passage first. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished. And that word astonished means insane or beside ourselves. Certain women of our company said things that was dri that, that's driving us insane or making us beside ourselves. They were early at the sepulcher. Verse 11, if you drop, uh, drop back in the passage and read verse 11, it says that they, the disciples, thought that what those women were saying were idle tales. Look that word up. It means, Strong says it means twaddle. T-W-A-D-D-L-E. It was twaddle. Twaddle means foolish nonsense. It, it literally means incredible. We use that word wrong. We was, boy, that's incredible. And we mean it is a good thing, but the word incredible is not a good thing. In, incredible means it lacks any credibility. So they heard what the, the uh, women said, and they said that lacks any credibility. It cannot be believed. All right? Verse 23, And when they found not his body, they came, saying, that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. They're telling us they went to the tomb, the tomb's empty, and that they saw angels, and the angels said Yeshua was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found that even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Keep all of that in mind. Now go back to verse 21. Today is the third day since these things were done. When I first began to see that first fruits had to be on the 16th, this verse here troubled me greatly because it seems to say that he was appearing to them on the 16th. And if that is so, then he could not have been in the heart of the earth three days and three nights in Matthew 12. And 1 Peter and Jude make it clear he was in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So it caused me to spend hours upon hours studying and contemplating the words written here. And you know me, I looked up every word. <clears throat> I could find no inconsistency in how any of these words were translated. I looked up the word today. I looked up the word the third. I looked up the word day. I looked up the word since. I looked up the word things. I looked up the words were. I looked up the word done. And when I say I looked it up, I didn't just look it up to see what the definition was. I went throughout the whole Bible figuring out, looking to see how these words were used in every place that they were used. And I could find no inconsistencies in how any of the words were used. <clears throat> I spent hours and days researching the use of those words and they all seemed to be translated correctly. And I spent days with a heavy heart. Uh, that may sound odd to you, but it isn't to me. If, if, if he wasn't raised on the 16th and if he didn't descend into the darkest places of the heart of the earth to preach, I want to know. If he appeared on the same day as he was raised, I want to know. Because if he did, my calculations on first, fruit, first fruits were not correct. In the heaviness of my heart, I realized something. I realized there was one word that I had failed to look up. And it was such a small and tiny word, I did not see the need to work, look it up. And it was the word translated is. This is the third day. I knew what the Greek uh, word for is is. The Greek word for is is esti, and I didn't see any need in looking that word up in that sentence. Boy, was I wrong. The word in verse 21 translated is is not esti, E-S-T-I. It is not the Greek word esti. Instead, it's the Greek word 
Ago. A-G-O. <laughs> and ago does not mean is. Ago does not even mean anything close to is. But yet they translated ago as is. Ago means to bring or to lead or to go. Ago. Go. That, that's a lot different than is. And there are dozens and dozens of uses of this word in the scripture. And if you examine them all, you will see that every time the word ago is used, there are three components found where it's used. I'm not going to read you the dozens and dozens of places where it's used. Y'all should have said thank you. I'm going to show you one example. You can find the others if it's of interest to you. But there are dozens of them. Matthew 21, 2. One example. You need to look at it so that you can see the components I'm talking about. <coughs> saying unto them, this is Yeshua, verse 2. Saying unto them, go into the village over against you and straightway you'll find a donkey tied and a coat with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. A go is properly translated there as the word bring. Bring is the correct translation, not is. Now here are the three components you will find every time you look this word up. Every time you look it up, you'll find these three com components. Number one, somebody or something is going to do some bringing or leading. Number two, something is going to be brought or led. Number three, it's going to be brought to someone or be brought to somewhere. All right? And the disciples are in this one are going to do the bringing. The donkey is what's going to be brought. And where are they bringing it to? To Yeshua. That's correct. So somebody or something does the bringing. Something is brought, and it's brought to someone or somewhere. With that in mind, go back to Leviticus 20, or excuse me, Luke 24, 21, and let's translate it properly. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel, and beside all this, today brought the third day since these things were done. Today brought the third day since these things were done. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense either until you go and look at a Greek lexicon and you see that not only did they change the definition of the word ago, and they made it say is instead of brought, but they changed the word order up. Why would they do that? Think about it for a minute. Why? Would they take a word that they know that it doesn't mean is and make it say is? And why would they change the word order up? For the exact same reason that they make me a sabbaton say first day of the week. Me a sabbaton does not mean first day of the week. Me a sabbaton means one Sabbath. But because they want to prove that he was raised on the first day of the week... And that he appeared on the first day of the week at a sunrise service. They translate things improperly and change things they ought not change. So they can push a doctrine that ought not be pushed. Word order makes as much, word order matters as much as the correct translation matters. I'll use it this way this time. I could say... Matthew brought a handsome man tonight. I can alter the word brought and change the word order and make it say this. Tonight, Matthew is a handsome man. There's a lot of difference between saying Matthew brought a handsome man and Matthew is a handsome man. You understand? You change the word order up and just change two words out, one word out and make it a different word, then you completely alter the sentence that I spoke. 
That's exactly what they did in this passage. The correct word is, is not that this day brought the third day to them. No, the correct word order is the third day brought something to them. Hear me. It doesn't say this day brought to them the third day. They are declaring to Messiah the third day brought this to us. Once we understand that, we'll see what they're talking about. It brought this day, a day different than the third day. The third day brought this day. What did this day, what is it that the third day brought to them this day? Confusion and sadness and heartache and, and, and being confounded. Here's what Cleopas and his friend told the Messiah. They said Yeshua, who we thought was the Messiah, was nailed to a stake. They said there were some women who went to the tomb this day and they found the tomb empty. They went and told the disciples and they came and told us all of this twaddle. Peter and John went and checked it out and they found an empty tomb. But they did not see him. The women said they saw angels which said that he said that he would rise a third day. We didn't believe them. Their words seemed like idle tales to us. The angels told us that he rose on the third day and was alive. But there's nothing to give those words any credibility. The tomb's empty. He's not there. We can't find him. That third day brings us to this day where a tomb is empty. Women, women are telling us a bunch of twaddle and we don't even know where the body of the Messiah is and you're asking us why we're sad? Because the third day brought us to this day where nothing makes sense to us anymore. So there's that word ago. Somebody or something brought something somewhere. The third day brought this day to us with confusion and heartache. This day brings grief. It brings a missing body. It brings women acting hysterical. So, that confirms for me what I've been saying all along. And that is Messiah was crucified on the 14th day of the first month. He was resurrected on the third day. By definition, that has to be the 16th. He was in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. On the third day and third night, he was in the heart of the earth in his resurrected body. On the fourth day, Mia Sabaton, on one of the Sabbath, his empty tomb is found and he begins to appear to those whom he loved so very much. He lives, he was resurrected, he descended first, he appeared, and then he will ascend. I spent a lot of time on this one verse and on one word, the word ago, because it should matter to us that what we read is accurate. Yes. Mm. This is not only the beginning of first fruits, but what other feast are we also in? What other Moedim are we also celebrating? Unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. Unleavened bread says you get the leaven out and for seven days you're to do what? Eat unleavened bread. Eat unleavened bread. What does unleavened bread represent? The body. The body. Sin Say again. Sin represents sin. Unleavened bread or uh, leavened bread represents sin, but what does unleavened bread represent? Let me let me back up and say it to you this way. One time Messiah told the disciples, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And they got all confused and said, oh my gosh, he's upset at us because we forgot to buy bread and bring it on this trip. And when he perceived their thoughts, he corrected them. What was he talking about? Their teachings. Their teachings. 
He said, I'm not talking about bread. God, I got meat to eat that you know not of. I don't care about the bread. I'm telling you to beware of the false doctrine of the Pharisees, their teachings. And so unleavened bread that, that we're just now entering into the, the second day of it, unleavened bread is a time where he tells us, consume it. For seven days, consume it. Well, he's telling us to consume truth. That's what it represents, truth. Uncorrupted, unadulterated truth. And so it should not, it shouldn't shock us that we have to dig into the scripture sometimes to see the truth. It shouldn't shock us that sometimes when we're reading the translations that have been passed down to us, it shouldn't shock us that sometimes we have to work diligently to get the leaven, to find the leaven and to pull it out and throw it away. So that we can see the truth that's buried in there. Of course the enemies buried leaven in our Bibles. Of course he did. Shouldn't shock us. But if we're diligent and we'll study it, we can find where he twisted it, remove it, and see the purity of the truth that is written there. Did you notice how Messiah straightened those disciples out on the road to Emmaus? He simply took them back to Torah. Luke 24, 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Messiah to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And in verse 44. He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. <clears throat> Somewhere in this day that began at sunset, Yahweh raised up Yeshua. Yes. Because the third day has begun. And I don't imagine that Yahweh waited very long. Do you? All he said was the third day he'll rise again. But somewhere in this third day that began at sunset, Yahweh raised up Yeshua and he descended first. Then on a Mia Sabbaton, that year it would have been on the 17th, he appeared. Hallelujah. He is our first fruits. I'm going to read this and I close. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that the Messiah died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's how Messiah knew when he was going to be raised again. It was written in the scripture and patterned in the Moedim. Yes. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Don't read past that. Verse 5. And that he was seen. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain in this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. His resurrection is not something that we just believe in our heart that it took place. He said it would take place, so we just believe in our heart that he was raised from the dead. Paul said, no, he was raised from the dead as the scripture said the third day. And we know that it happened because we saw him. Cephas saw him. 
500 saw him. The women saw him. James saw him. And Paul says later in that passage, he says, I saw him. He is alive. So he was seen because he was resurrected and he will appear again. And his appearing again is where we realize to the foolish, fullest that he is the first fruits of them that sleep. Because we also shall be made alive like him. His death, his burial, his resurrection are the surest things that you can ever know. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As his name is put upon you, so shall he himself bless you.